And we're going to continue to stay on this topic of looking at the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that it's better for you if I leave. Uh, because if I don't go, the Spirit won't come. Jesus used language around the Holy Spirit that tells us that there's something really, really important about the Holy Spirit. We know that uh, God is on the throne. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. And that it's the Spirit that's down here with us. And um, so we've been, been spending a bit of time looking at this uh, person. Uh, the Holy Spirit is not a force. It's not like Star Wars where, you know, the force is strong with this one and, and, and the, the force be with you and so on. But we've been looking at the Holy Spirit's personhood and we've been <laughs> looking at uh, uh, being filled with the Spirit. We've taken some time. We've looked at the question of tongues. Do you have to speak in tongues to be filled with the Spirit? Uh, last week, we looked at the issue of why is it that if we are truly filled with the Holy Spirit, why is it that we still battle and we still struggle? I mean, surely once we're filled with the Spirit, we will just become perfect people. Who, who ever thought that? If I could just get filled with the Holy Spirit, I will never get mad at anybody ever again. And then you got married. <laughs> and then you had a child. And then you had a job. And, 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 and basically life unfolded in front of you and you realize that you've got to come to uh, either change your perspective of what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit, i.e. I'm not perfect, either change that perspective or you end up sitting there going, well, I mustn't have the Holy Spirit because there's still a big part of me that's human. It's like this disease I can't shake off myself called humanity. And so last week we dove into that and we looked at how there's this battle. We literally are in a conflict zone. The flesh and the spirit inside of us are both screaming out for influence and control in your thought life, in your decision making, in what you do. And so there's this battle that rages inside of us. Uh, before I had the spirit, I didn't have that battle because I didn't care. I just did whatever I wanted and there was no conflict in that moment. I just did whatever I, however I felt led to do and to be and so on. But then the spirit comes and all of a sudden I, I can't just go there because there's something inside of me going, hey, Alan, there's a better way. There's a better way. I'm still in control. Anyone heard that old analogy about, you know, let Jesus jump in the driver's seat. Anyone ever heard that? That when you get saved, become a Christian, you get out and you put God in the driver's seat. I understand what that picture is painting, but it's not actually true. How many know that? How many of you know you're still in the driver's seat? You still are. God lets you stay there. Jesus doesn't say, get out of the driver's seat and let me in there. He says, I don't want the driver's seat. I gave you your life. It's a gift. It was a free will gift. What I want is to sit in the passenger seat and give you the directions. I want you to choose to take my advice. I want you to choose to go in the direction that I'm telling you to go because it's the best way for you to go and it's the best direction and course you can take for your life. So God doesn't take control of us. And how many of you wish he would? Some of us wish he would. I, I, I know if God took control of me, I wouldn't have that problem anymore because God wouldn't do that. God wouldn't take me down that path. God would take me over here and I just wouldn't have any more problems. But God doesn't take control of us. He allows us to maintain control, but his spirit fills us and begins to influence us and change us, empowers us when we choose the right path. The spirit of God empowers us to do that, which once upon a time we probably couldn't do because we kept getting dragged over here by the flesh to do those things that we didn't want to do. It's like Paul says in Romans, I think it's seven, the thing I don't want to do, I just keep on doing it. Anyone amening that? I don't want to do it, but I keep doing it. But, and, and the thing I do want to do, I don't do it. I don't do it. And he throws his hands in the air. He goes, man, why, what is it? Whoa, to me, what is this battle that's going on? But he ends by saying, but thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. By the power of the Spirit, we can have victory over that. And so we've been looking at the Holy Spirit. I want to continue to look at the Holy Spirit. But this morning, I want to look at a different aspect of the Spirit. And uh, if you can go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 and 13 says this. It says, just... As a body, though one, has many parts. Everybody, you're sitting there and you've got one body, but, but, but you, you've got fingers and you've got wrists and elbows and you've got knees and you've got all different parts. So when we say, uh, um, that's my body, that body is a, is, is a construct. It's made up of many individual members that are linked together that form this thing that we call a body. It says, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free, 
And we were all given the one spirit to drink from. I want to look at what he says here. We were all baptized by one spirit. We didn't do it ourselves. I didn't, I didn't put myself into the body of Christ. God did that. I didn't place myself. I don't, I, don't just, I don't just turn up and go, well, you know, because I go to a church meeting on a Sunday morning, then I'm part of the body of Christ. Well, according to what these ancient writers believed and what they wrote, I don't put myself into the body of Christ. God does that through his Holy Spirit. So you can be going to church your whole life and not be a part of the body of Christ. Isn't that an interesting thought? But yeah, you could, you could probably be the sort of person that people might look at and go, well, you're here one day, not the next, not the next. That's, but yet you could still be a part of the body of Christ. So looks can be deceiving. And I, I, I reckon there would be lots and lots of people that, that go to church and we go to church every Sunday and we maybe pray a prayer, especially when we're in a time of crisis or need. Uh, we, we, maybe we do some good deeds, some good charity stuff. Maybe we serve in charities. Maybe we do all this sort of stuff. And, and we would think that, look, for all intents and purposes, we do all the things that the body of Christ does. Just because you do the things the body of Christ does, it doesn't mean you're part of the body. We become a part of the body by surrendering to Jesus, being filled with his spirit, and it's the Holy Spirit that baptizes us, immerses us, places us, dips us continually in to this thing and binds us together to become a part of this thing called the body of Christ. Amen? It's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's not just a decision. I don't just decide, hey, I want to be part of the body. No, no, I've got to surrender to Jesus. I've got to repent of my sins. I've got to make the decision that from now on going forward, God, I agree with you about life and everything to do with it, and I'm going to head in the direction you want me to head, and you're going to empower me by your Spirit. And in doing so, he places us into this beautiful thing that he calls the body of Christ. We're placed into the body of Christ. We are so intricately linked together. You and me, we are so intricately linked together that the writers in the New Testament refer to us as a body. Isn't that amazing? We are one body. One body. One body. Not, not a bunch of different ones, one body. So next time we, we think about that church down the road, and we don't like a doctrine of theirs, or we don't like something that, and we want to speak ill of them. Just, just keep in mind, you're hurting your own body. You're hurting yourself when you speak about another brother or another sister. How many of you know other believers who are quirky? They've got quirky characters and quirky natures. And, or, who knows a quirky person? Amen. Amen. Hands up if you know a quirky believer. Come on, let's be honest. Okay, those of you with your hands down, you're probably the quirky one. Now, here's the thing, even though they're quirky, even though they might not think theologically 100% the way you do, even though they don't worship the way you do, you like to raise your hands with loud rock music. They like to kneel on the floor with a, 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 chord, a synthesizer. Top. What do you call those things they used to play? Pipe organs, with a pipe organ. You know, Maybe you like to pray with a rah, rah, rah when you walk around. Maybe they don't. They just like to sit quietly. All these different uh, expressions and all these different ways, don't ever speak ill of them, even if you don't understand, because we're all, according to what the Holy Spirit does in us, we've been bound together and we are one body people, like it or not. We're one body. Isn't that awesome? It's wonderful that right now there's a part of the body meeting here. There's another part meeting down the road, another part meeting here, another part. There are different parts of this body, but even though we're in different rooms right now listening to different preachers and worshipping different ways and having coffee with different, we are one Big, massive body. Isn't that awesome? Our body is huge. It's huge. It's huge. I don't know about you. I spend most of my time trying to get rid of some of my body. I've spent years trying to diminish my body. But, but, but God's not diminishing his body. God is trying to expand and grow his body. And we're a part of that body. We're also a part of the process of expanding and growing his body. Lord, this is not your body. It's mine. Would you take it away? But God's growing his body. What an awesome thought that we are that intricately linked with each other. Leslie, you and I are that intricately linked that we're basically one body. What an amazing thought. What an amazing thought. That's why it says in, 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 in the New Testament, the writers, they, use, they say these things like, you know, if, if one part of the body is mourning or grieving, we all grieve together. Why? Because it affects all of us. I, I can, if I hit my toe with a hammer, guess what? It's going to affect every other part of my body. And if you don't believe me, I want you to go and do it, video it, and I'll play it on the big screen. You go and injure a certain part of your body. It shudders through the rest of your body. If I hit my toe right now, you know what's going to happen? My hands are going to clench. My eyes are going to water. My jaw is going to tighten up. My mouth's going to scream. Ah! 
something's going to happen in all the other parts of my body because it's intricately connected. It says we rejoice when others rejoice. Your rejoicing is our rejoicing. Your victory is my victory. Your victory is my victory. We share in all of these experiences of life. Why? Because Christ has poured us or dipped us, immersed us, baptized us into one big unified thing that he calls his body. And we get to be a part of that body. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47, this is right back at the very beginning when this body called the church was first uh, created. Now go back, actually, if you go back the verse before to, uh, to, to verse 41, it actually tells us that in verse 41 that uh, 3,000, I think, people got saved that day. This is just after Peter has preached and said to them, if you repent and be baptized and put your faith in Jesus, you will receive the Holy Spirit. This is what he's just said. You can go back and read it. And so in verse 41, it says that they did that. So what happened? They repented. They turned in faith towards him. They believed. And at that moment, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And what's the first thing that we see happen to them as soon as they're filled with the Spirit? Well, the first thing we see is the formation of this body. It says this in verse 42 to 47. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The minute they gave their lives to Christ, the minute they were filled with the Spirit, the first thing that we see happen is a group of people formed a community and began to do life together. They began to do life together. This is what it means to be baptized into one body. It means that we as a community now begin to do life together with other parts of that body. You know, we've got this, uh, this mentality in the world that, that you know, young kids are growing up and, and there's this, this, this push for independence. I just want to be independent. I want to get to a point. Maturity is when I don't need you anymore and I move out of home and I don't need anybody. It's almost spiritually kind of the other way around with God. That, that maturity is coming to a place where I become somewhat, somewhat interdependent on other parts of the body. I become needing, I, I need other parts of the body. You guys express the, the, the character and the nature of God to me in a way that I'm not going to experience by myself in a prayer closet. You, 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 you give me visible expressions of an invisible God when I do life with you. It's one thing to read about grace and the grace of God when you mess up. It's another thing when I mess up in front of one of you guys and one of you human beings come to me and go, hey, I forgive you. And you extend grace to me and I experience and see in real time how that grace outworks. It's one thing to know that God forgives my sins, but when we do wrong by somebody else and they forgive, it's one thing to know that God, my, my God meets all my needs. It's another thing when God uses a person that comes. I remember when we were living in India uh, many years back and there, there was a point one night there where we literally had no money. We lived in India. It wasn't like uh, today where you can get an ATM machine and you know, if you wanted money in India, you would go to the bank. The minute it opened at 10 o'clock in the morning, they would send a telex from Nagpur to Mumbai. Then Mumbai would send uh, a... a, a um, uh, I don't know if it was a telex or what it was, but they would send something back before emails through to Sydney, uh, and then Sydney would check the account to make sure that these Aussies had money in the bank. Then they would go back to the telex machine in Mumbai. Then Mumbai would telex back to Nagpur, and then Nagpur would come and say, yeah, you got the money, or no, you don't. But the problem is that nobody was paid full-time to stand at a telex machine in Mumbai or Nagpur. And so they could, they could, that they, they would just be somebody would walk past and see a piece of paper and go, I wonder what that is. Oh, these people, they got the money, they could do and then they would come and tell us. And there were days where I would rock up at 9 o'clock in the morning and nothing would ha and start the process. And then at 5 o'clock, they'd say, oh, sorry, we haven't heard. Come back tomorrow. You spent the whole day there. You know, it's, praise God for ATM cards. Just bang, boop, 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 bang, there's the money. Hallelujah. Awesome. Instant money. 
But I remember one time we had no money. And, and, and we're sitting there, and you know, it's one thing to be praying and to be believing and knowing that my God shall supply all my needs. And I believe that. But you know what I've found in my life? Most of the time, he does that through another person. Most of the time he does that through another believer. And we had this Indian couple, these pastors, they knew nothing about our financial situation, nothing about where we were at. Knock on the door, we answer the door, and here's this Indian, here we were. We went over there to minister to them and teach them about God and faith. And here's this Indian couple at our door with bags of groceries going, hey, we feel like the Lord spoke to us, we need to bring you food. And they gave us food. And there's something about that moment where we go, God, all these invisible attributes of God begin to come alive when God uses visible people to express them to other people. And so we, we need each other. We're one body and we need each other. And the first thing that we see in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit came and this body of Christ was formed, the first thing we see there is that they began this journey of actually doing life together. Now, that's not easy for some people. I know that. Some of us don't like to do life together with other people. Some of us have been hurt. Some of us have been burned before. Some of us have opened ourselves up just enough and somebody has run in there with a hammer and started beating you up. And so you don't want to do it anymore. We don't want to open up anymore. We don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to show who we really are. I've often thought that, that, that if, you, if we could see spiritually into the spirit realm on a Sunday morning, how many churches would be like masquerade parties? Hallelujah. How are you? I'm fantastic, brother. Praise God. Oh, awesome. And then you get out of the car park, you take it off, throw it in the chair. Oh, you relax and you breathe and you're back to yourself again. It shouldn't be like that. We should be free to be who we are, warts and all. I mean, God, the truth is God knows anyway, doesn't he? God knows anyway, doesn't he? And we're part of the body, so the real you is connected to me, not the image you want to portray. It's the real you. And it's the real me that's connected to you. We're a part of a body. So the church does life together. It's the first thing that we see when the Holy Spirit falls in the book of Acts. And I just want to throw a few thoughts out uh, at us this morning about this. Just three things to think about that happened when the Holy Spirit came in relation to this. It says in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And we know about that because, you know, we get into the Word of God and, you know, we, we believe that and, and teaching and so on. And we all podcast and read books and so on and we get a bit of input. But the second thing, they devoted themselves not just to the apostles' teaching, but they devoted themselves to fellowship as well. They were devoted to fellowship. If you go on in verse 44 onwards, he then expands what did that devotion to fellowship look like? And that's when he goes on. He says, all believers were together, had everything in common, sold their property, gave to people they had need, continued to meet together in temple courts, broke bread in homes, had glad and sincere hearts, praised God and enjoyed favor. He unpacks what it looks like to be devoted to fellowship. So three things that I just want to point out this morning out of this. Number one was that they actually devoted themselves to fellowship. They devoted themselves to fellowship. How many of you know that it's impossible to devote somebody else to something? Who knows that? Who's ever tried to devote their children to study? You can't devote your children to study. If it's not in them and they don't want to devote themselves to it, to use an old colloquial saying, you are flogging a dead horse. Exactly. They have to want to devote themselves. You can't devote somebody else to study. It's impossible. Men, have you ever tried to devote your wives to football or fishing? Have you ever tried to devote them to it? I've gone so far as to buy a pink fishing rod. I mean, I've tried it all. My wife, she will come with me, but she's certainly not devoted to fishing like I am. You can't devote somebody else to something, even if you're overly passionate and devoted yourself to it. You can't devote somebody else. You've got to devote yourself to things. Wives, how many of you have ever tried to get your husband devoted to making a bed or putting a toilet seat down? You can, you can do your hardest, go your hardest. You can try to devote them to these things. But if it's not in them, if they're not devoted to it, you're going to have to keep putting energy, time and pushing and pushing and pushing to try to make something else happen. These guys were not just devoted to practices, but they were devoted to people. They were devoted to people. Verse 44, all the believers were together. They were together. They were devoted to one another, not just to doing spiritual disciplines, not just to, 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 to doing the spiritual stuff, the, the praying and, 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 and attending a, a, a Sunday morning gathering and reading a Bible. These are wonderful things, and they were devoted to those practices as well. We know that from the same passage, but there was a sense in which they were also devoted to being together. They were devoted to each other, not just devoted to practice, but these guys were devoted to people. They made the personal decision to dive into community. They made a personal decision to dive into community. 
The effectiveness of the early church was not found in what they did, but in who they were. They were people who devoted themselves to this new form thing called the body. You know, when we, when, when, we, when we started Arise, and we still do this, and those of you that have been here for most of the journey would know this. You know, we, we, we don't ever want to do so much stuff and make things so busy that you've got no time for people out there. We've always had that policy. But you know, at the same time, I go back and I look at this group that we call the early church. By the way, isn't it funny? We call them the early church as if they're an earlier version. It's like the, the, the early, uh, you know, the early um, Mitsubishi Magna as opposed to the later model. And the later model has got all the kinks worked out. You know, the early model of anything is basically a test crash, you know, but as it evolves, it gets better and better and better, doesn't it? It's funny, I look back at what we would term the early church and I think, mate, it's almost like the first model was the best. And what's happened since then? We've drifted away from certain things. And we cry out to God and we say, God, would you be to us the God you were to the church in the book of Acts? And I remember one day very clearly sensing the Holy Spirit when I was praying that prayer say to me, I'll be to you the God that I was to the church in the book of Acts when you'll be to me the church I had in the book of Acts. And I thought, oops, better stop praying that prayer. That's getting too real now. It's getting too real, cutting too close to the bone. We need to choose to dive into community, not stay at arm's length. So even though many of us have been hurt before and many of us have our reasons, I want to encourage us this morning that, that we need to make the decision in ourselves to dive into community. Dive back in. You might have been in there, got hurt. Can I encourage you? Dip your toes back in the water. It's the plan of God. It's the purpose of God. It's, it's what the, this thing called the body of Christ is all about. We were not immersed in so that we could spend all of our time out and jump away from and sometimes, and as, as I said, we, we never make things too busy here, but there's another part of me that thinks, but you know what, but, 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 but we don't want to make it so not busy that it's almost like we just pop in occasionally. We're like an occasional acquaintance with one another. We just pop in and then we disappear back out there because I think there's something really, really powerful about community and doing life together. It's part of the plan and the purpose of God. Part of the plan and the purpose of God. We devote do we devote ourselves to community or do we simply devote an hour and a half a week to a meeting? Just a question, something for each of us to wrestle with and to think about. Am I devoted to this community? Am I devoted to the body of Christ? Or am I just devoted to an hour and a half of a meeting on a Sunday morning? It's just a question. When I go back and I look at the early church, I see people that were devoted to a community. Second thing, they were actually together. It says that they were actually together. Verse 44, all the believers were together. That word together is an interesting uh, word in the Greek. It's been translated. I'll give you the translations. 196 times it's translated on. 120 times it's translated in. 159 times it's translated upon. 41 times we get the word unto. 41 times we get the word to. And 339 times it's got a, a, a miscellaneous translation. And this is one of those times where it's got a miscellaneous translation and they translate the words together. What all of these words have in common, though, is that they speak of an intricate connection. You know, the best way I think I can describe it is anyone ever played with a Lego set? Anyone ever played with a Lego set? And you get the blocks of Lego. And, and you know, each block is an individual block, isn't it? It's, it's its own block. You can take that away and separate it and put it over there and pull all the parts uh, apart and lay them on a floor. And you can clearly see they are individual, unique and beautifully made and crafted blocks. But then you grab them and you can put them together. And anyone ever seen that? I'm not a Lego person, but I'm in awe at some of the things people can make with Lego. Have you ever seen some of the amazing... I mean, they make, they make fishing boats the size of fishing boats out of Lego. They replicate all kinds of buildings and bridges, and they even have shows that go all around. There's a show on TV called Lego Masters. Anyone ever seen Lego Masters? And you look at it and you go, all that beautiful, beautiful picture. You know what that started with? It started with a bunch of individual little pieces of plastic, but somebody saw something, and they grabbed the individual bits of plastic, and they stuck them together in a certain way, and they created a masterpiece out of that. And when I think about this word and I think about this concept of us being together, that's exactly the picture that I get in my mind, that we're all placed together like Lego set, like building blocks. Now, here's the thing with a Lego set. We might be all connected in the sense that we're part of one thing, but I'm not necessarily touching every piece, am I? So it's not like we're living in each other's pockets. It's not like I have to be everybody in this room's best friend. 
and you don't have to be everybody's best friend. There are going to be, there's going to be a piece of Lego that's kind of attached to you that links you to another and to another, but at some point there's going to be a piece of Lego over there, and even though you're not touching it and it's not touching you, but it's the acknowledgement, but we're still part of one big picture. We're still a part of one big thing. We may not be touching every other block, and we don't need to be everyone's best friend, but we're all a part of the same structure. And we need to acknowledge and understand that. These people work together, not just for an hour and a half on a Sunday. It says actually that these guys gathered together daily. Notice that? It says that they, that they gathered daily. I know people who go, look, coming to, church, coming to one and a half hour meeting a week is, is hard enough. It's hard enough. And so the thought of a connect group, for example, I'm not going to commit myself because it's just life's too busy. But at the same time, they're the ones that will have discussions and go, we want to get back to what the early church was like. Well, hey, guess what? This is what the early church was like. They were connected. They weren't balking at going, oh, I'm too busy to come on a Sunday morning and gather with my brothers and sisters and grow in my faith and worship God. It's too, too tiring or too busy. Uh, and I'm certainly not going to come to a connect group. Now, I'm not going to do that once a fortnight because it's too much time. It's, and I think, well, how, how do we ever expect to get the kind of community, the kind of power, the kind of stuff that's going on here? How do we ever expect that if we want to detach ourselves from the bigger picture of the Lego and allow ourselves to be scattered everywhere? I understand that we're busy. I understand times have changed, but I also understand that God has not. I also understand that the heart of God to reach the world is the same as what it was right back here in the very beginning. I also understand that the power of God is as real and as alive today as it was way back there in the beginning. I've had people say to me that, oh, you need to go back to, you know, the early church didn't meet in buildings. And this is the thing they'll say. If you go back historically and have a look, it's actually not true. They've found uh, archaeological discoveries of places where they have big courtyards and they smash the fence down in the courtyard between two uh, houses and they could seat up to 150, 200 people. So they had 200 people there, at least in one of their gatherings, but people will argue and say, you shouldn't do this. Oh, you should do house churches and so on. And, I, and I've, I've, I don't argue either way. My personal opinion is I don't care how you gather, just gather. Just gather. I don't think God cares whether it's in an auditorium with 5,000 people or whether it's in a home with, with five other people. I don't think he really cares. Just gather. Just get together. But they'll argue about the, this. And oh, we meet in house church. So I'll say, okay, that's great. But if you're more biblical than me, I'm assuming you do it seven days a week. Well, no. Well, stop arguing with me about which is best. If we want to get back, these guys met all the time. These guys did it daily. It wasn't just, uh, church was not just a, a pastime or something they tacked on. Uh, we were at a, a conference this week, and one of the speakers made this statement. He said, if Christianity is anything, it has to be everything. If Christianity, if my faith is anything, then it has to be everything. I don't have an option if I'm truly following Christ to go, well, this can be a little part of my world. I don't know that Jesus ever gave any of his followers an option to go, that Christianity can just be like a little part of it. You just, just take a little bit. He said, no, it's, if, if, if it's anything, then it's got to be everything. It's got to be everything. These guys met together. And thirdly, it says that they had all things in common. They had all things in common. Now, now let me just explain something here. What, was, what did they have in common? Let me say this. It wasn't the things, all right? Now, I don't know if you've ever heard uh, people say that, you know, they sold everything and, gave, and, and, and therefore you should sell everything. And so on. They didn't have all things in common. It's not talking about the things when you read this passage, all right? We know that because later on it says that they took their own things sold their own things, whatever price they decided to get for it, and then they distributed their own things wherever they decided it was to go. So please don't think that it meant that all their stuff became communal. And if you do believe that, uh, Owen, can I have your Lexus after church? I just want to take it for a spin. That's okay, because you worked hard for that. It's yours, and, and it's not mine. Even though we're a body, everything in common, it doesn't mean they had everything as in all their possessions. The things were not the issue. What it meant was this that their values, their ethics, and their passion for the kingdom, they had all that in common. And because they had all that in common, they looked around and they went, wow, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to help this person in need because we've all got that in common. We see a need, we want to help that person. We see a need, we want to be part of the answer. We see somebody grieving, we're going to grieve with them. We see someone rejoicing, we're going to rejoice with them. The things they had in common were not the things it was not the things, it was the ethics that they had, that they had adopted. It was this new worldview that they had adopted. It was the new mission for
for their life. It was the focus on building the kingdom. That's what they had in mind. That's why in Acts chapter 5, when Ananias, everyone remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira, and they come and they sold a, a, a field and they brought the money. What did, what, what, did, what did the disciples say? They said, why has Satan lied, to, filled your heart to lie to us, to lie to the Holy Spirit? He said, when that property was yours, didn't you have full possession of it? In other words, it wasn't communal, it was still yours. And when you sold it, didn't you have control of the money? I mean, it's your money. It's your money. So some people think that this means that we should all just go and buy a commune somewhere, sell everything and live together. And, you know, I, I can just walk to your house and take whatever I want without asking because it's all common. It's not saying that the actual practical things were common. What they're saying is that the ethics, the values, the mission that all those people collectively shared because they saw Jesus Christ as Lord, God, Savior, Redeemer. Because they saw who Jesus was and because they knew that he was God. And because they knew that life is but a temporary drop in a bucket and eternity is what really matters. Because they knew that, everything down here took on a different perspective. Everything down here took on a different perspective. We're not now living just for the building of our own kingdoms, the, the building of our own life, the collection of things and toys. We're living for something way bigger than that. We're living to allow our life to be salt and light and to express God to the rest of the world. That's what we're living for. This is what they had in common. Care for those in the community of faith. They had that in common. Gathering for spiritual formation with a community of faith. They had that in common. And sharing daily life as a community of faith. They had that in common. It was their values and ethics and mission that was different. I love verse 47. See, the result of a community living like this, it says the Lord added daily. The Lord added daily. The church was never meant to be a movement of people who go to meetings together, but a movement of people who do life together. We were never meant to be a group of people that just go to meetings together. We were meant to be a group of people that did life together. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you what that looks like. All I know is that I can read Acts chapter 2 and it gives me a little bit of a picture of what it looks like. That they broke bread together. That they spent time together. That they cared for the needs of one another. That they, 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 they got in groups and spiritually formed together. That they worshipped together. There are things that they did together. They didn't just go Sunday morning, 12 o'clock, bye-bye, I'll see you next Sunday morning. It was more than that. It was more than that. And that's what God envisioned and calls his church. That's the body of Christ. And it's very, very quiet in this room here today. And, and, and that's okay. That's okay because sometimes for some people it's a lot to take in. What does that mean for me? You know, one of the hardest things we found here at Arise in seven years has been trying to get people just to meet in a connect group. It's been so hard. But it's not, we, don't want, we, we, we don't want people meeting in connect groups because it's great for Arise as an entity. No, no, that's how spiritual formation takes place. By gathering together by exploring God together, by praying with one another, by, by letting our gifts flow, uh, by encouraging one another, by grieving together, by cheering on together. That, that, that's how life goes. That's how It's generational. That's how, how, how people learn. Our older generation passing on to the younger generation. The younger generation being close enough to the older generation to ask questions and glean and learn. That's what the body of Christ is all about. It was never meant to be, let's just get together and have a meeting on a Sunday morning. In fact, Jesus spoke about the importance of this in relation to the mission of the church. In John 13, verse 34, 35, Jesus said this. He said, A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples, if you love one another. In other words, the world out there, he says, the world around you are looking. And he said, you want to know how they're going to know that you're a follower of Jesus? It won't be because you preach with eloquent words. They're not going to go, oh, he preaches with great eloquent words. He must be a follower of Jesus. Oh, he quotes Bible verses. He must be a follower of Jesus. Oh, he prays for the sick and they get healed. He must be a follower. of Jesus said, no, no, no. He said, by this will all men know that you're my disciples. If you love one another. If that world out there sees you doing community together and doing life together and loving one another and caring for one another and supporting one another, and being there for one another. He said, if you will do that as a community, that's how people will know. How do you treat other believers is very, very important in regards to the mission of God through your life. Sometimes we think that God, the world's just looking for a transformed individual. I actually think the world's looking for a transformed community. 
Community is important to people. That's why a nine-year-old kid right now in Los Angeles is going to join himself to a street gang, even though he knows, he knows, he knows, he knows. Not only because of statistics, not only because of promotions and advertisement, but because he's experienced it and he's seen it in his own family and friends. That he'll probably be dead by the age of 15. But he'll do it anyway. Why? Because he wants community. He doesn't have it at home. Maybe home's broken down. And so they link themselves to these gangs because the drive to belong somewhere is so incredibly powerful on the inside of humanity. It doesn't matter who you are. The drive is so powerful. That's why peer pressure is such a strong thing. It's not that the person giving into it is necessarily always weak. There's a thing behind that. There's this drive to want to belong somewhere. And if I've got to misbehave to belong there, I'll misbehave. It's not about the misbehaving. It's about the belonging. I want to belong to a group. I want to belong somewhere. There's this drive inside of us. It's a God-given thing for community. It's a God-given thing for community, and the church is God's answer to that longing in the hearts of men. And Jesus said, if you do community well, if people see you loving one another, if they see you loving one another, he said, by that will they know these guys have got to be the real deal. These guys have got to be followers of Jesus. The world isn't simply looking for a transformed individual. It's seeking a transformed community. In fact, without the community, your witness to the community is diminished. You're recognized as a disciple by the way you relate to other disciples. Not miracles, preaching, worship, leading, community service, etc. It's how we treat others. That's God's missional intention. Can I get the band back? We're going to finish with a song. Everything I'm talking about here, this is the normal Christian life. This is normal Christianity. I know sometimes we hear this stuff and, we, and, and sometimes we read stuff in the Bible and we read about the early church and we go, oh, that's like, you know, um, high level Christianity. You know, we would go, that's high level Christianity. It's, it's funny. I just don't see anywhere in this collection of ancient documents, anywhere where anybody says, I'm talking to you about high performance Christianity. Anyone, a business person here, you would know high performance leaders and high... Hey, I don't see anywhere where they distinguish between what is normal Christianity and what is high-performance Christianity. This is just normal Christianity. It's just normal Christianity. Well, it was according to these guys in the first century. This is normal Christianity. And to us, we, 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 we're not sort of brought up that way. I guess we're brought up in a, in, a, in a society, maybe as we get older, where we sort of disconnect a bit more, a little bit afraid to let people in, scared of being a little vulnerable. What might it cost me? in time, in energy? What might it cost me in resilience if people don't fully understand me the first time? Maybe the second, maybe it'll take them a bit longer to get used to me, I don't know. But this is normal Christianity. 